Assalamualaikum and good day to everyone. Our topic today will be on lab techniques in virology. And this topic is under the last yellow of this course regarding lab techniques. In this topic, you will be explained about the different types of techniques in virology lab for diagnostic purposes. One of the most important aspects in handling virology specimen is timing. Some viruses, especially RNA virus, cannot survive too long outside of its host cell and delay may affect the test result. Another factors like collection site and when the specimen should be collected, for example, after one week or IgG testing, also play a role in determining the test outcomes. Temperature for storage is also very important for virus containing specimen. Except blood, all forms of specimens must be kept in minus 80 degree freezer if not immediately processed. Non-enveloped or naked virus is more stable than enveloped virus to temperature changes. However, if possible, frequent towing of the samples should be avoided. The viral transport medium should be supplemented with bovine serum albumin or BSA to maintain the virus stability as well as antibiotics and antifungals to prevent contamination. Example of commonly used viral transport medium is PBS glycerol. Normally, Normal saline should never be used as viral transport medium because the pH can easily change and will destroy the virus. In this lecture, we are going to look into several laboratory methods in virology. Actually, this method range from visual antigen detection, genomic identification and cytopathic effects. <coughs> Firstly, electron microscope. This is a conventional method in detecting virus, <coughs> however due to its complexity, only trained people can carry out the process. It can be very challenging to find virions in all fields and that's why it is considered low in sensitivity. However, in some cases, it can rapidly identify virus and possibly simultaneous detection of two or more virus species from one sample. Normally, specimen for electron microscope will be stained using phosphotungstic acid, which penetrates and gives contrast to the virus. These are the pro and contrast of using electron microscopy, some of which I mentioned earlier. This TAM or transmission electron microscope image represents adenovirus. You can clearly see its icosahedral capsid structure. And this is a typical appearance of rotavirus. <coughs> they are small icosahedral virus. And this muruku like appearance of TAM image is actually helical capsid of para influenza virus. This is scanning electron microscope or SAM image. Compared to TAM, the genome is not visible in SAM, but the external image is very excellent, as you can see on the figure. Second mode of uh, laboratory method is detection of viral antigen. The detection of viral antigen by antibodies is very specific. This type of method is widely used in laboratory diagnosis. These are the three main scopes of antigen detection for viruses. ELISA, latex agglutination, and immunofluorescence. All of these methods employ the reaction of specific antibody towards specific antigen on the virus, most commonly the surface antigen. Their difference lies on the subsequent reaction. For ELISA, most of you know it, the secondary antibody is linked to the enzyme, such as proxidase, which will turn into blue color when the final substrate, such as ABTS, is added. The intensity of color formed after substrate addition is proportional to the number of bound antigens and it can be analyzed qualitatively, for example by scoring method, or quantitatively by using OD value from the ELISA reader. Sometimes up to three layers of antibody are used, for example tertiary label antibody. This increases the binding sites for antibodies and thus provide more sensitive readings. Another techniques of ELISA called competitive ELISA. 
Theoretically, the antibody and antigen from the sample is premixed and later added to the solid phase, which also contain the similar antigens, and this uh, provided by manufacturer. If antigens or the virus present in the sample, then less free antibody bind to the solid phase antigen. In this case, the intensity of color formed is inversely proportional to the number of antigens present in the sample. And then, latex agglutination, which is the simplest antigen detection method. Several antibodies are attached on each latex particle. When bound to the antigens, they will clump together, forming a visible clumping pattern and indicates positive results. The third method is immunofluorescence. Similar to LISA, except the sample smeared onto slides and enzyme is replaced by fluorescent dye which glows and visible through a fluorescent microscope and indicates positive results. Direct fluorescent use only one level of antibody, while indirect may have secondary and tertiary antibody, which increases the binding sites and amplifies signals. So the immunofluorescence is one of the best methods in virology because it is specific, sensitive, cheap and easy to do. This diagram shows the example of indirect immunofluorescent method. This fluorescent microscopic image shows the presence of respiratory syncytial virus or RSV in a sepharyngeal cell. This image also represents RSV in respiratory cells but using different fluorescent level as compared to the previous one. Another example here shows positive cytomegalovirus infected cells from cell culture specimen. Next, detection of viral antibodies, either IgM or IgG. Laser techniques is commonly used by coating the target antigen on the solid phase. Besides an electron microscope and antigen detection, virus may be detected using antibodies. Methods like ELISA, complement physician test, and hemagglutination test may be used to measure antibody titer from serum or plasma. <coughs> In this ELISA method, the well is coated using anti-human IgG, which will bind to IgG against a particular virus, and then the subsequent steps are as explained earlier. As I said, the outcome of ELISA is either quantitatively measured or qualitatively observed as shown above. By looking from top of the wells, you can determine the strength of a reaction. Now, let's look into cell culture technique for virology. This technique is both for cultivating virus and diagnostic testing. As we know, viruses are only living inside cells, so the cell culture is important in virology. There are many species of virus that grow well in cell culture and the virus can be easily extracted for further testing such as serotyping or genotyping. However, not all human virus are cultivable. Norovirus, for example, is a non-cultivable species which make diagnosis quite challenging sometimes. Some species of virus grow but very slowly. Besides, cell culture method is very costly and not suitable for routine medical laboratory practice. That's why other techniques, especially serology testing, is more preferable in a hospital setting. In fact, cell culture technique is a conventional method in virology. Traditionally, scientists use chicken eggs for virus culture. The eggs were incubated at 37 degrees and monitored daily for the presence or growth of viruses, for example, by placing the egg in front of a candlelight in a dark room and then the monolayer and roller tube cell culture techniques were introduced. These techniques use few types of suitable cell lines for virus growth in a nutrient-rich fluid medium. The cell lines also consist of few categories depending on the purpose. For one-off virus culture using primary cells or for indefinite duration of culture using heteroploid cells such as HeLa, for example. One of the outcomes of viral cell culture is cytopathic effect. 
This is defined as the morphological changes shown by the cells upon intracellular virus replication. The effects are variable depending on the species of virus, which include rounding, refraction, sensitium, or even destruction. This is how cytopathic effects of a virus on cell culture being observed on daily basis. No staining needed as you can see the cells quite clearly. Depending on the virus species, either epithelial cells or fibrous cells may be used in monitoring cytopathic effects. This is how it looks in adenovirus infection. The cell morphology changed and destructed as well. And of course, this is syncytium formation and caused by RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. The specialized F spikes present on the envelope of this virus cause cell-to-cell -cell integration as shown on the right image. Another example here is a HSV infection on fibroblastic cells and poliovirus on the same fibroblastic cells. You can see the more damaging effects caused by poliovirus as compared to the herpes simplex virus previously. The cytopathic effect also may be examined under electron microscope to see further detail on the damage. As seen here, the HIV infected lymphocyte. Now plug assay. This method also uses cells but they are cultured on a semi-solid medium like agar. When infected by virus, the cell is structured and leaves an empty space or plug. One plug, nine plugs, and it will uh, be more plugs when live for a longer time. Normally, the virus stock will be serially diluted, and plugs from at least three plates from three different virus concentration will be counted, averaged, and calculated for plug forming unit or PFU. Like this. But this consists of two sets of three different concentrations. <coughs> For PFU calculation, one set should be enough. Sometimes crystal violet is applied on top of the cell layer to make the plugs are more clearly visible co for counting. <coughs> so the plug forming unit, or PFU, is basically the number of plugs that can be formed by a virus species in one milliliter of the sample and the unit will be PFU per ml and it determines the severity of a single virus species for example poliovirus is 3 times 10 power of 6 PFU per ml and herpes virus is 1.5 times 10 power of 6 PFU per ml this is an example how to calculate plug forming units Plug reduction assay is a method to determine the effectiveness of antiviral drug, similar to plug assay, but the reduction in the number of plugs is measured in this case. Plug reduction assay is categorized as a phenotypic assay, as the virus phenotype is altered by drugs and this affecting their infectivity. You can see in this example how increasing concentration of drug reduces the number of plugs. Histology and cytology specimen also play a role in virus detection or identification. For example, human papilloma virus and herpes virus can be identified from pap smear sample and CMV from sputum sample. The last part is genotypic assay, one of the most important and commonly used in virology. This includes nucleic acid amplification by PCR and genome sequencing. PCR is divided into conventional PCR and real-time PCR. Both amplify nucleic acid but real-time produce results when amplific amplification is still going on. PCR is very useful because we can amplify our gene of interest from one strand to millions in just about half an hour. This gives more sensitivity and specificity in diagnosis. You may study this figure to better understand the principle of PCR. 
This is the outcome of conventional PCR. The amplicon is run using a gross gel electrophoresis method instead using nucleic acid dye such as ethidium bromide to visualize the band. The thickness and brightness of the bands represent the number of amplified genes. Position of the bands related to the amplicon size in base pair by comparing them to the DNA ladder. Multiplex PCR use several sets of primer to detect unknown target gene in one reaction. For example, the primer sets are able to detect a wide range of respiratory viruses from sputum sample. PCR ELISA is just another variant of PCR, combining PCR amplification and ELISA to read the results. Although sensitive and specific, it is quite laborious and complicated since the amplicons need to be labeled with enzyme. I did mention about phylogenetic tree before. After a full or partial sequencing data of a genome is obtained, there's a lot of subsequent analysis that can be done. This advanced procedure is especially important in tracing SARS source of an outbreak to monitor epidemiological pattern and to identify new strains or mutant strain. For sequencing, normally we just outsource the sample to research lab which has the sequencing equipment. It takes less than one week to receive the results normally. This is how sequencing results are obtained by applying different color labels to each base which are A, T, C and G. BLAST is a free online tool where we can submit our sequencing data and it will search for the most similar sequence from its large database. You may click on that link to go to the website and try yourself. Cluster W is also a sort of online tool for us to come up with phylogenetic tree between our sample and other closely related sequences. In phylogenetic tree, the vertical distance of each branch from main tree is matters. It represents the similarity or differences between each sequence. You may get more information online regarding this topic. I will also provide a tutorial note for RT-PCR procedure to improve your understanding for this topic. With that, thank you very much.